God created sex, he designed it as, part two of the sentence, a good gift. He designed sex as a good gift. And I know some of you, uh, you know, you're uncomfortable right now. Uh, you, you grew up in religious circles where like any association to the word sex brought uh, shame and secrecy or sexual desire, shame and secrecy, couldn't talk about those things. And, and yet this is what God created. And so we're not ashamed to celebrate what God wasn't ashamed to create, right? Like what's that say if God says, here's the gift for you, and we say, okay, I'm gonna just hide that in the back room. I'm, I'm gonna put that in the closet. I don't want anybody to really know about that. Thanks, hey God, thank you for this gift, but I'm, I'm gonna treat that like it's something to be ashamed of. Now, what's that communicate to God as the creator of that? I, I know that some of you, I'll get messages this week from some of you who think that this sermon's inappropriate and we shouldn't be talking about sex in church, but that's our brokenness around it. Like, that's not how scripture approaches this. Song of Solomon in the Old Testament tells about a passionate uh, love between a husband and wife, and it's, it's full of sexual language and imagery, celebrating physical union in marriage. And in chapter five, verse one, the husband and wife um, have just made love in this chapter. They're lying in bed, they're cuddled up together, and we read this moment. It's the only moment in the entire book where God speaks. It's the only time where we hear from him is right after this moment. And, and God's not angry or upset, like, God doesn't look down at them and say, what in the world was that? Like, what, what are you doing? Like, that wasn't, that's not the tone of this. Instead, here's what we read, chapter five, verse one. God says, eat, O oh, friends, drink. Yes, drink your fill, O oh, lovers. God celebrates it. It's a, good, it's a good gift, a picture of satisfaction, a picture of connectedness. This one flesh that God had in mind, this intimacy, I think it's been understood somewhat, although perhaps incomplete, in an experiential way throughout history. But in more recent years, science has learned more about how our bodies uh, find emotional bonding during this physical union. During sex, oxytocin is released. It's a hormone that causes a person to feel emotionally attached to the other. It's actually the same hormone that's released when a mother is breastfeeding. It, it creates bond, it creates attachment. And so this is a beautiful gift that God gave a husband and wife. Like when you get married, here's God's gift to you. This, this powerful biological response that ties your heart to someone else. There's this pair bonding that takes place. And of course you can violate that. It can be really dangerous outside of marriage. Lots of dangerous dynamics if you're single and things become physical quickly, it get, that, that, the power of that confuses your feelings. Some, some of you have experienced this. It confuses your feelings, it creates this premature attachment, and, and this, is why, this is why sometimes a breakup can feel like a divorce. It's, it's because this gift has been opened outside the context of what God had in mind, and so when this bond takes place outside of marriage, it, it can erode this with, with your spouse. But it's a gift, it's a gift in marriage. It's a gift that God wanted for a husband and wife to experience together. Um, it not only connects a husband and wife together, but biologically, it's just interesting the more we learn about it. It boosts our immune system, it lowers your blood pressure, lowers risk of a heart attack, it acts as a natural painkiller and muscle relaxer, it improves sleep by releasing prolactin. A decade-long study of 1,000 couples showed it translated into living longer. It keeps you looking younger. One study uh, of couples who had frequent and consistent sex looked seven to 12 years younger than couples who didn't. I turn, I turn 73 next week. I seven, I seven, like God. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> so, that's stupid. I, a, a, good, a good gift isn't just something Here's the point, a good gift isn't just something to be tolerated, it's something to be celebrated. So God gives us this good gifts, gift, and when we tolerate it rather than celebrate it, I think that's offensive to God. So listen, let me say this clearly. This is not just God's gift towards husbands. It doesn't seem like that should have to be said if you just read scripture. But part of the problem is 
culturally, and even among those who believe God created sex, sometimes overtly or inadvertently, we seem to define sex this way, as God's plan for husbands to experience pleasure and physical release. That's how it sometimes gets talked about, like it's this one-sided physical act for men. That is not biblical. That's not what the Bible teaches. And the reinforcement of that narrative throughout oftentimes history or generations has created this self-fulfilling problem that is often, often has to be addressed in marriages. It's not something God just created for husbands. If that were true, then why did God create women by many measures to have a greater physical capacity for sexual pleasure than men? And so it's meant to be this mutually pleasurable gift that God gave for both husbands and wives. So here's our sentence. God designed sex. He knows how it works. He, he, he designed it for a purpose as a good gift. Like it might not seem good to you because it's been taken advantage of or it's caused a lot of hurts. It happened, some things happened outside of God's plan for it, but his intent was for it to be a good gift for you to experience in your marriage, here's the last part of that sentence, God designed sex as a good gift for you to give to your spouse, for you to give to your spouse. It's rightly enjoyed when a husband and wife are, are generous with one another. It doesn't work the way it's supposed to if it's only going one direction, but when a, a husband and wife are thoughtful and selfless and humble and tender and passionate and encouraging and supportive, it, it, it's, it's a beautiful gift to give to one another. And so if you look at it this way, then it, it changes your approach. It, it's something that God gave you to give to. You start looking at it through that lens. Oh, God's given me this gift, and part of me experiencing his generosity is by giving it to my spouse. And when you have a husband and wife who are both committed to that, it's, it's a beautiful thing. I especially appreciate the way the message paraphrases 1 Corinthians 7. Paul writes to a church in Corinth they are trying to have a sexual ethic that honors Jesus, but they're in a world with lots of sexual dysfunction. And, and their tendency was, and this has sadly sometimes been the approach of the church in these types of things, when the world goes this far, they just swing the pendulum way over to the other side. And so there was this idea in the Corinthian church of even in marriage, you shouldn't have anything to do with each other sexually. And so Paul writes to correct some of that he says, sexual drives are strong, but marriage is strong enough to contain them and provide for a balanced and fulfilling sexual life in a world of sexual disorder. The marriage bed must be a place of mutuality. We read that and we're like, well, yeah, of course. First century, that's not how that would have read. They would have been, what? Because in those days, the, a, a wife would have had almost no rights. It wasn't about her. Paul says, no, in, in marriage, it's a place of mutuality. The husband is putting his wife's needs ahead of his own, seeking to satisfy his wife, and the wife seeking to satisfy her husband. Marriage is a decision to serve the other, whether in bed or out. I love that. It's a decision to serve. It's an opportunity. Marriage is an opportunity to live out the example of Jesus to, to serve, to live out Philippians 2 of considering others' needs ahead of our own. And, and one of the ways you know you're not doing this is because you hear that and you think, oh, I hope my spouse hears that. I hope my spouse hears that, that he or she should be putting my needs ahead of his or her own, right? That mindset means that you're not doing it because you're thinking how they need to do it rather than thinking about how you can do that as a servant. One of the prayers I pray over couples when they get married is, God, may their greatest moments of happiness come from seeing one another's needs being met. I think that's... A, it's a response that parents understand. If you're generous with your child and, 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 and you see them delight in that generosity and, and, and they're grateful, it, there's nothing better than that. You'd rather do that than do what you wanna do. And in marriage, when there's that mutual commitment, it's just, it's a beautiful thing. I, I want you to think just for a moment of how contrary this definition or this sentence is to the way the world has discipled us to think about sex, where sex is selfish, and we're conditioned to think of it as, uh, it's for my needs, it's to satisfy my desires. Um, an example of this, you know, on the more extreme side would be pornography. That porn wires your brain to think of sex as this purely physical act, and here's what it conveys, kind of a, uh, 
a more poignant example of what our culture would convey is that when it comes to sex, we are users and we're consumers. We're users and consumers. And so when you, when you watch porn, you're creating these neural pathways in your brain that become a sexual script for your relationships where you are a user and a consumer, which is the opposite of what God designed it to be, where you are a giver and you are a servant. It, it, it reinforces the narrative, oftentimes, not always, but it reinforces the narrative that men are sexual users and women are sexual objects, and it teaches that the, the approach to sex is to selfishly take rather than generously give. If God designed sexual pleasure to bond you to the person you're with, here's, here's a question. What happens when the majority of the sexual pleasure you experience is by yourself? Like, what happens? Well, it bonds you to yourself. It's all about your needs and your desires, and they should be met on demand. And this is why we see this increased but um, much more clear connection between narcissism and excessive pornography use. Not surprising that those two things are being found to go together because it teaches you that sex is a consumable commodity and, and that it's something that you're owed. Uh, it, it, it teaches a sexual user, you don't have to give anything, all you gotta do is take. And, and, and culturally, that's just, I mean, it's just the opposite. Let, let me put it in two different sentences to compare this. The world would say sex is a physical act that makes you feel good. Kind of like scratching an itch. It's a physical act that makes you feel good. The Bible would teach God designed sex as a good gift to give your spouse. And you see how different that perspective is. And so here's what I wanna do for a few minutes is I wanna talk about how to be sexual, how we can be sexually generous with one another in marriage, okay? You up for this? <laughs> Nervous laughter. Just wanna take a minute to say hi to my mom. Thank you, good to, really nice for you to come to church this weekend. And um, um, yeah, I wanna talk about this because the Bible, again, the Bible would celebrate it. I, I do want to just, before jumping in there, I do wanna just point out a few potential landmines so I wanna say something clearly if you'll listen in on this. I, I, I realize there's some people, a risk in a sermon like this is that there's some people, there is a spouse that is emotionally exploitive, coercive, demanding, entitled, that will try to weaponize what I'm about to talk through. Don't do that. There's a spouse that will listen to this message and become more entitled and more demanding, and if you do that, you are missing the point of the message. Instead of becoming more generous and more thoughtful and more tender, you become more demanding and more entitled, and I just want you to know, if you decide to play it that way, if you decide to play it like that, it will do nothing but drive your spouse's heart further away. The moment you use this message to make your spouse feel shame, you can bet they will lose any desire for any of it. Demanding and exploiting is robbing your spouse of the opportunity to be generous with you, which whether you believe this or not or know it or not, there was a day when that's what your spouse really wanted, really wanted. And your demanding and your exploitation robbed them of that chance. And, and you're sabotaging any chance you have of the kind of sexual intimacy that you were made for in your marriage. I also know that there are some spouses who hear this and they will fear, feel bitter and resentful. Like your spouse has made mistakes in this area. They've caused perhaps a lot of hurt in this area and you refuse to give your spouse any chance to change. Like that wall is built up and, and you're not gonna be hurt like that again. There's not gonna be any vulnerability there. And when you hear messages like this, you feel yourself become even more bitter and more cynical because of what you feel like you were robbed of, but you're now robbing your spouse of an opportunity to grow in generosity and to do things differently. And so, all that to say, listen, what I'm gonna talk through here is designed for a mutually loving marriage between a husband and a wife who genuinely desire what's best for one another. That's the context of this conversation. Do not, do not use this sermon as ammunition to shame your spouse. You hear me? Do not do that. And do not use this sermon to build bricks of bitterness in the wall that's already dividing you. Don't do that. So how can we be sexually generous 